need more of that uh, yeah. flask later. Uh, all right, folks, uh, thank you for attending. Um, this is Getting a Migraine. Um, I'm Jonathan, or JBO for short. Uh, this is Mike or Michael, however uh, you want to call him. And Anurag uh, was unable to come to DEF CON, but still uh, he took an, an extremely important part in this research. Um, we're all Microsoft researchers, which is kind of weird because like Microsoft usually do Windows stuff and not uh, Apple stuff. However, um, we, work for, we work for Microsoft Defender, and the reason why it's called Microsoft Defender, not Windows Defender, is because it runs on platforms that are not Windows. And we do, um, we do Mac, uh, Android, iOS, Linux, uh, those kind of stuff. So this is kind of like a motivation that we have. Um, this is not a Defender talk, um, but I mean, just, just shows you that, like, where we're coming from. Um, the outline for today is talking about uh, uh, some of the macOS uh, mechanisms, specifically SIP and entitlements. Uh, we're going to talk about how we found a vulnerability by mistake, kinda. Uh, how we automated our exploit uh, by means of reverse engineering. We'll have a demo. Uh, we'll talk about the implications of what we've done. Uh, we'll talk about Apple's fix and basically fixes, I would say. And then we'll have some conclusions. So uh, let's get to it. Some background. Um, SIP, or rootless, uh, is a mechanism in macOS. If you're just unfamiliar with macOS completely, um, it's a mechanism that limits the capabilities of the super user of root. If you're coming from a traditional POSIX world, uh, root can do anything, and that's not true anymore. Um, in macOS, even if you're running as root, you can't do a bunch of stuff, including in user land, which is kind of foreign to a lot of folks. Um, what it does is to leverage something called the Apple Sandbox in order to protect the entire platform. Um, by default, you can't turn it off without going into Recovery OS. I won't talk about Recovery OS too much today, but generally what it means is that you like have to like uh, to hit a bunch of keys and then reboot. Like you have to have physical machine. You have to solve the Hellraiser puzzle and stuff like that. Um, so you're not supposed to turn it off like at all. And um, several organizations, including Microsoft, like in our own internal network, actually monitor and make sure that uh, SIP is always on. Um, you know, as as a defense in depth mechanism. Um, and. We'd like to think of it just mentally, that's not accurately at all, accurate at all from a technical perspective, uh, that it, it, it's kind of like SE Linux on Linux or uh, protected processes on Windows in the fact that you know, you're admin, but you don't own the machine anymore uh, to some extent. And uh, SIP limits uh, certain actions of the root user and all users really um, to, as the name suggests, uh, to protect the integrity of the system. So that means you, there are certain files you can't override, there are like uh, kernel operations you can't do and so on. Um, and we'll be talking about that uh, more thoroughly in the next couple of slides. Um, SIP itself internally um, is controlled by NVRAM variables. Uh, there are actually, there, there's actually more than one, but uh, we're going to talk about CSR active config on Intel platform. And uh, in the Apple silicone that runs on ARM, they have a thing called LP SIP0 that is read from the uh, booted device tree. Um, and interestingly enough, because Mac OS, like XNU specifically, the kernel is kind of like half open source or like 90% open source, uh, you can find all the flags uh, in the source code under csr.h. And I name here just a few. It's not a complete list at all, but you can, you can again kind of imagine uh, what SIP does, so for instance, it won't let you load uh, unrestricted, uh, you know, just any kernel extensions, which which are re really drivers. Um, you can't write to uh, certain file system uh, locations, which we'll be talking about today. You can't get uh, task ports for a given PID. A task port is basically like uh, open process in Windows or, or Ptrace in Linux. You can't really debug processes for what it's worth. Um, you can't do kernel debugging, you can't do dtrace, you can't write NVRAM variables for obvious reasons. If you could, you can just change like SIP altogether. And um, there are other flags here, here as well, but the issue that I wanna talk about is the fact that it has a certain domino effect. What I mean by that is that 
If you have, let's say, an NVRAM variable uh, override, a way to bypass the NV, uh, NVRAM uh, variable write uh, protection by SIP, you can bypass SIP. Obviously, you can just overwrite like the bit flag in uh, CSR active config. And similarly, if you can load an untrusted kernel extension, you can just write a rootkit, but also bypass SIP. Um, and in fact, any part of SIP you can bypass actually like topples the entire domino of SIP. So that's important to note. Generally, if you were able to bypass one mitigation, you were able to bypass all of them, uh, in theory and also not in theory. Um, a bit about uh, SIP and file system restrictions. If you're a developer or, or malware author or whatever it is, that's probably the first thing that you'd notice when you come across SIP um, is the fact that you can't really write to certain uh, paths in the system because SIP actually prevents you from doing that, again, if, even if you're running as root. Um, so SIP really prevents you from modifying any files that either have a specific extended attribute called com apple rootless, or ha are configured in some uh, file system library sandbox config, uh, rootless.conf, and that's like a, 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 a naughty list, I guess, for files that basically if a set of files that can't be uh, overwritten, but there are also allow lists for these restrictions uh, that override like the rootless.conf, and they're out of scope for this talk, uh, but they're well documented. Uh, obviously, the rootless.conf uh, file is SIP protected by itself. Otherwise, again, you'd be able to change it and then and then do a bunch of stuff. Uh, and also, you can't uh, really add or delete the com apple rootless extended attribute for the same reason, right? If you could add that external attribute, you can create like an undeletable malware, for instance. If you could remove that, you could bypass SIP because you could modify uh, files that are protected by SIP. So just keep, keep that in mind. And um, generally, like Apple has released uh, a modification to the LS, uh, to the LS um, um, command. If you do LS-LO, that's a capital O, an actual O, not a zero. Um, then uh, all the files that say restricted are basically files or directories or, or symlinks or whatever they are that basically can't be modified. So, um, so that's an example of a restricted file, for instance. Um, so how, I mean, that, that's obvious, right? I mean, we have SIP, we basically have a different kind of layer in the system, if you will. And how does the thing work and how do, how do we enforce things in, in Mac OS? Uh, some background about entitlements, really. In the Mac OS ecosystem, processes are signed, right? And they're granted something called entitlements, which are basically capabilities. So um, because entitlements are part of the signature of the process, you can't forge them easy, easily, at least, unless you have like a gazillion PS4s and you connect them and I don't know, find a collision or something. Um, and you can think of entitlements of a way to make a process stronger, right? Again, in terms of capabilities. Um, and the interesting part is that Apple has private entitlements that they will only grant to their own processes. And because they sign everything, they won't sign your processes with those entitlements. These are known as private entitlements. And that essentially creates like a barrier or a capability-based security layer, if you will, because if you're able to only run, um, uh, to only get certain uh, capabilities or entitlements, but not the other type of entitlements, and Apple are the only ones who can have that entitlements, and the entitlements are being um, uh, translated into capabilities by the OS, it basically means that Apple has the keys to the kingdom. They control your box. You don't control your box uh, as much anymore because you can't get those capabilities. You can't get those entitlements. And uh, that's something very interesting, especially for us, again, Microsoft Defender, because we don't have those capabilities either, right? Um, and you can think about the implications, uh, which we will be talking about later. For instance, uh, you know, because, because we, can't, um, we can't, let's say, uh, modify the com apple uh, rootless extender attribute, if there is a file that is naughty and have that extender attributes, we're, we're kind of like, we're kind of screwed because we can't really uh, delete that file. That's just an example. Um, and uh, there are two very interesting entitlements for SIP file system restrictions. There are actually more, like SIP is very rich, as you could see, 
but there are these there are the two very interesting entitlements that I want to talk about today, which are com Apple rootless install, and that basically bypasses all the zip file uh, file system checks. So if you have a process that has that entitlement, which is a private entitlement, it can basically bypass all zip uh, file system checks, which is really powerful. And then you have something even greater, which is called com Apple rootless install heritable, which inherits to all child processes the com Apple rootless install which means that all of the child processes are going to be able to bypass SIP file system enforcement uh, on their own. Now, if you think about the motivation, why, why do these things even exist, right? Like, why, why punching a hole through that security layer? Then you have to think about the name, com apple rootless install. These things are used for installations and updates. For instance, when Apple wants to do an OS update, they basically have to... Um, uh, they have to write to certain files, then those files might be protected. And that's the way they do it. They have, let's say, update an updater. That updater has that, uh, those capabilities. And then it's able to do whatever, uh, uh, overwrite arbitrary files and so on. So that's, that's the motivation that Apple has to even having the, those entitlements, if that makes sense. Um, so this, is this was all just background. Now, um, while performing routine malware hunting, we started noticing a process named DropSip. And the name itself like, is, is suggestive, as you can think. Uh, and that seems to be prevalent on many devices. And we were like, oh, cool, we found some malware and probably some zero day in the wild. We were very excited. And a closer inspection revealed it's an Apple signed binary that runs under the system migration private framework directory and actually drops capabilities that bypass uh, SIP file system checks uh, with an API called CSOPS. That's a private API that I will be discussing in the next slide. And mentally, we think that it should have been called drop drop SIP, but I mean, I mean that's what it is. And it's not malware. That's the entire reversing, <laughs> that's the entire file actually, so reversing it is not even like a thing. Um, as you can see here, basically what it does, that's the main function for all means and purposes. Uh, what it does is really call uh, CSOps with 12. Uh, 12 is CSOps uh, clear installer, which uh, I, I, took the, uh, I took the liberty of, of pasting like the screenshot from the XNU source code which basically uh, removes, as you can see, like this is a not, uh, the tilde uh, is a not flag basic, a binary not flag that removes the CS installer and other stuff as well. Uh, CS installer is the com apple rootless install and CS exec inherit zip is the uh, rootless install heritable entitlement, by the way. Um, so basically what it does is to remove the uh, installation capabilities or C bypassing capabilities of a process and if it's successful in doing so, it will basically run exec VE on the, uh, on the like, command line and arguments that it got. Uh, and that's basically a, some mean uh, that, uh, that they have to run a file without having those uh, SIP bypassing capabilities. So that's just a motivation. And we were kind of like, uh, we were kind of convinced that uh, drop SIP is legitimate. It's not malware, it's, it's owned by Apple. And basically what it does is to drop those SIP bypassing capabilities. So this is kind of where our journey begin. Um, we noticed that uh, the drop SIP uh, uh, process is a child process of system migration D, which is a daemon. That's why it has a D in the end of its name. And it has the com apple, apple rootless install heritable entitlement, which if you remember from three slides ago, uh, basically uh, inherits uh, SIP bypassing capabilities to all its child processes. And that explains why drop SIP assumed that it has SIP bypassing capabilities to begin with. I hope that makes sense. Um, and after concluding that drop SIP is legitimate, we basically decided to look, take a closer look at what other child processes system migration D has, right? Because it's a very powerful process. It's able to, uh, to give all its child processes SIP bypassing capabilities just for fun. Uh, it depends on your definition of fun. Um, and then, this is a screenshot uh, uh, just showing the, the uh, entitlements of uh, this system migration D uh, process. You can use code sign. That's the binary that Apple gives you to basically look at the signature, and that includes the entitlements. And as you can see, 
uh, the set of entitlements. Uh, there are three entitlements that start, start with com apple rootless, and the second one is com apple rootless install heritable. I won't talk about the other two, but they're really interesting if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, now, this is, again, not a talk about Microsoft and EDR and everything, but any EDR that it's worth its salt, you can basically ask questions like, hey, in, the, in my organization, give me all the processes that have so-and-so, right? All the processes that have command line blah and so on. So uh, what we started doing is that, okay, we have, we're Microsoft, we have an EDR, we, we have tons of data. Uh, even from macOS, uh, and then we were like, okay, let's start hunting with EDR data. And that's really good because you have a lot of different environments, a lot of different customers and whatnot, and uh, also internally in Microsoft, uh, we do have folks that run macOS as well, and they also report all the command lines and whatnot internally, right? So we were like, okay, give us, uh, dear EDR, please give us all the child processes of system migration D. And we immediately noticed two interesting child processes, uh, which are bash and Perl, right? These are just command lines. Uh, um, again, these are child processes of system migration D, so they're very powerful in terms of C bypassing capabilities. Um, why are those uh, child processes in interesting? Well, bash and Perl are interesting because they're interpreters, and interpreters are affected by many things, uh, especially environment variable poisonings. Now. Uh, in macOS, I won't talk too much about the security mechanisms in macOS, but injection in macOS is, is a real drag. It's not like Windows or Linux when you can just run open process or ptrace. Uh, and especially Bash and Perl are still like baked into macOS and therefore Apple signed and actually are protected by SIP. So you can't get a task, a, a task port to those processes and you can't inject into them. Uh, and that's why we needed like a different method of injecting uh, to those processes, and because they're interpreters, they're more convenient than others. Now, remember, these are processes that are uh, child processes of system migration D, so the OS does not enforce SIP uh, file, uh, file system policy checks on them, which is really helpful. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, environment variables. So we found two noteworthy environment variables. Uh, this, these are just man pages of Bash and Perl. Uh, for bash, you have environment variable bash underscore env, and apparently if you have that environment variable, you can just like write arbitrary commands there, and like bash will just run them, which is good and bad. Um, for, for Perl, it's, more comp it's not really complicated, but you have Perl 5 opt for options, and you can also make Perl 5 opt by modifying it. Uh, you can make it run arbitrary uh, Perl commands, which is really great and bad at the same time. Um, now, this is like I'm doing a sidetrack here. This is a general rant about uh, environment variables. Shellshock happened in 2014, if you guys remember um, how bad it was. Basically, it was a, a, like uh, a, a vulnerability in Bash that was related to uh, the parsing uh, of environment variables and how they're eventually executing. Uh, but it's it's like we haven't learned a lot about the dangers of environment variables, and it just took like the couple last couple of years, even this year, like uh, in in different platforms. Really, they're not all Mac OS. Like if you look at it, like the first one uh, from 2023 is in Linux, right? It, in a pseudo binary, in a suite binary, no, no less, uh, which took years to, um, uh, to to really make secure, and apparently not enough. Uh, and you have other cases here as well, including uh, including Linux, including um, including uh, Mac OS, and other things as well. And that doesn't even start like scratching the the, the surface, because you have other issues that do not normally get CVEs, like UAC bypasses on Windows, and you can override like the WinDir directory or uh, cloud credentials that are in in environment variables and API keys, like literally everywhere. So environment variables are very dangerous and and should be you know uh, should be taken care of. Um, and this is where I turn over to Mike to talk about our exploitation strategy. Uh, that man with the flask is a goddamn hero. This is a fantastic tradition. I just wanted to say that. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. So so like JB was talking about, uh, the environment variables were the main thing that we went after. Environment variable poisoning. Uh, so we went about trying to um, 
uh, validate this as a val uh, vulnerability that can be exploited by setting bash EMV and Perl 5 opt. Uh, and from there, we put the payload in the appropriate folder, and it was just simply a matter of getting system migration D to uh, run one of these two interpreters, which is a lot easier said than done. Uh, it, it felt like every single combination I tried didn't result in bash or Perl being run at the end, uh, which was frustrating, but eventually I was able to find the uh, right combination of just creating like a, a single dummy user, and from there uh, was able to get Perl to run. And that was like, like 4 a.m. I was talking to Nurag, who's in India, and um, he, he came up with Perl 5 op uh, exploit. And um, yeah, when I finally got to, to, to execute and validate that we got SIP bypass, it was an amazing feeling, and I was also like quite sleep deprived. Uh, so yeah, while we did prove that this is um, something that can be exploited, uh, it wasn't, um, perfect because we required like a physical USB drive to be attached to the device. Uh, migration, as you may or may not know, will log off all users, uh, requires manual clicking through all the windows, uh, and then of course it reboots at the end. So uh, that's not ideal for a remote attacker. Um, so this was a demo that we sent to Apple. I'm going to spare you all. I'm not going to make you watch uh, a 15 minute migration demo of me. Uh, namering on about the migration process, but uh, I just want to show a snapshot here where uh, at the end we're, we're writing over the Apple Kex exclude file. So um, if you don't know, Apple kicked everyone out of the kernel, uh, but there were certain kernel modules that Apple still allowed to be uh, loaded and executed, and all that's kept in a SIP protected uh, file called um, Apple Kex exclude list. Uh, so in the demo, I overwrote that file with just the word migraine as like a, a proof of concept to show that we can control these uh, SIP protected areas. Okay, so like I said, uh, the initial demo and everything was, was pretty uh, ugly. Um, so the main challenges here were to obviously get rid of all log off, get rid of reboot. We wanted to automate clicking, so uh, there's no user interaction needed. And obviously we don't want to have a, a USB of physical access for this exploit to run. Uh, so we began reversing and trying to figure out how we can uh, make that happen. So there's a top-down approach and a bottom-up. Top-down uh, was a very disgusting approach where we tried patching the uh, system binaries themselves to get the behavior we want. Obviously, naturally, I took the disgusting approach, top-down. Bottom-up was the more um, uh, uh, cleaner approach where we took the private framework that the migration daemon uses, and um, we tried to bend it to our will and... and call the functionality we need within that private framework direct, directly with our own binary. Um, spoiler alert, neither of these approaches worked and uh, we'll, we'll get into why that is. Okay, so uh, migration, like with most things in Mac, is not a simple uh, system. It's, it's complex and it's multiple different processes that communicate through XPC and IPC uh, to make this happen. Um, we were trying to find some kind of documentation on, on migration and how it all works. And of course, uh, Apple being Apple didn't offer us any of that documentation. And, and we couldn't find anyone who's went out doing this and reversing it. So as far as we could tell, we're the first ones to do it. Um, so let's get into the, the high level of migration. So these blue uh, squares, these are the key processes involved with migration. Um, you can kind of think of like migration as like a, a, a chain and each link in the chain calls into the next and the previous link validates that the, the previous caller has the appropriate private entitlement. Uh, so an example being migration assistant will call into MV system administration, but then MV system administration before it goes any further will validate that it has a com.apple.private.mv system administration uh, entitlement and system administration calls in a setup assistant and setup assistant calls into the daemon, all of which validate the previous caller. Okay, so migration assistant. This is the first link in the proverbial chain, and this is what you all are used to using if you've ever done migration. Uh, it's essentially the, the, the setup wizard for migration where you can port a PC or Mac devices. You can do it over hardware. You can do it over network, uh, all different options. Um, so with the top-down approach, I, I wanted to patch this out because the, the most annoying thing we had to deal with was the logout issue. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, the, the function that Migration Assistant uses is something called SACLO start logout with options. Uh, patching that out, unfortunately, didn't work for, for multiple reasons, and we'll show you why. Oh yeah, so um, this was a, a little funny thing that JBO noticed. So when, when you go from PC to uh, a MacBook, 
Apple was kind enough to represent the PC as having a blue screen of death. So um, w well played, Apple. Good job. Okay, so the next link. So uh, Migration Assistant will then talk with MVSYS administration. Um, and like I mentioned, it'll uh, make sure the XPC caller is, uh, has the appropriate entitlement, the MVSYS administration entitlement. Um, I obviously tried uh, calling MVSYS administration directly, thinking, oh, we can get around the, the log out by just making our own binary. And at the bottom here, uh, as you can see, this is the console output of it telling me to fuck off. So. Uh, you might be wondering, how does uh, migration work? Like, how, how is a user able to interact with a GUI uh, even though all the users are logged out? And uh, the answer to that is there's a hidden user called MV Setup User. Uh, MV System Administration uh, will essentially um, use this user for the entire process. So you're not actually running as your user, you're running as this hidden user. Um, there's no password, so we tried logging into it and thought we could get away with doing some, some fun trickery, but uh, those darn entitlements got us again. Okay, so setup assistant. So um, the MB system administration process will uh, eventually call into setup assistant. Setup assistant is like a generic utility used by a lot of different things uh, in the system. Uh, some examples would be like a system upgrade or accessibility wizard or of course migration and, and a whole lot of other things. Um, and MB System Administration essentially will talk to Setup Assistant and it'll put it into the context of migration and eventually it'll transfer uh, Migration Assistant into um, Setup Assistant context. So that's, a, that's basically what's being called uh, after a certain point instead of Migration Assistant. Um, of course, when it does that, it's validating that the entitlement is improved, uh, approved before it continues to do that. And then from there, Setup Assistant will talk with the main uh, main honcho, which is migration assistant, or uh, daemon, the migration daemon. And it does this with XPC, and of course, the system migration D will validate that the caller has the right entitlement. In this case, it would be a uh, private.systemmigration.daemon client. By the way, setup assistant is like filled with entitlement, so if you're looking for an interesting target, I recommend going setup assistant, and if not setup assistant, in their folder, there's other like just utility binaries that are ridiculously entitled. So. Uh, just some homework to do. All right, system migration D. So this was the bottom approach that that uh, bottom up approach that a new rog took. Um, when starting to reverse a system binary, we recommend you look, you start with the XPC handlers for like privilege escalation or Mac services. Uh, you can usually find those by opening up the associated plist uh, shown here, and this is the uh, migration daemon plist, and there are six Mac services that we began looking at. So as we were uh, looking at the migration daemon, it was apparent that this private framework was being utilized pretty much everywhere. And uh, uh, two key components for this were the uh, uh, object, the migration object that it uses, along with the start listener for connections function, which is how it handles uh, like a callback for valid XPC requests. Okay, so uh, when it does receive a valid migration request, uh, system migration D will create uh, a file in the location library slash system migration slash queue. Uh, and in there is all the, the um, associated um, metadata for the migration request itself, and it stores them in, uh, at that location. So we thought, okay, well, we'll just create a file there and we can bypass logout uh, by just putting a migration, valid migration file there. Of course, it's SIP protected, so we couldn't do that. Only system migration D can, can modify, create, or delete files at that location. So uh, anyone who has done migration can tell you that there is at least one reboot, if not multiple reboots, and the way the system can keep track of what the current migration request is, is it takes the, uh, one of the specified files and it renames it to in-flight at the same location that's SIP protected. All right, so why did our approaches fail? Well, like I mentioned several times, uh, the entitlements were the big thing. So anytime we tried talking directly with MV system administration, or the daemon itself, uh, we couldn't get very far because they validate that the caller has the appropriate private entitlement. Um, also, on newer Apple Silicon devices, while this isn't, there are workarounds for this. Uh, if you try to like patch a system um, binary, the kernel will prevent it from running, which is the code for that is shown right here. So yeah, we we basically couldn't directly access system migration D, uh, and yeah. Uh, so the, the, the 
even though we were dejected and our two approaches failed, uh, we, we started thinking maybe there's a way that we can you know, cut out migration assistant and just talk with setup assistant directly. And uh, we had an in-house tool that we created that uh, will log all events in the system, even through multiple reboots, and store them as like a buffer of files, if you will. And we noticed that when setup assistant was, was, was executed, it passed a flag called dash minibuddy yes. So we thought, well, uh, maybe there's other flags that we can pass setup assistant directly to, to create the migration uh, behavior so we can um, prevent the logout in, in, to begin with. So as we uh, looked into the reversing the setup assistant, we did realize there were uh, other parameters being used, and we'll show that right here. So this is the main handler from anybody yes. Uh, so if you call setup assistant directly, it's basically just a generic accessibility wizard that comes up. Um, and while none of these parameters gave us migration, it was really encouraging though, because some of them would have like completely different behaviors uh, and different windows. So we figured, okay, there might be something to this uh, passing setup assistant parameter to get this to run migration. So uh, while the main function didn't have what we wanted, we looked further and we found a function called uh, use debug parameters. And in there is a, a parameter it handles called dash MB debug. And when we used that, we were super excited to see that the old familiar migration windows were up and uh, yeah, that, that we were excited because that means no logout needed. If you, if you bypass migration assistant, uh, you bypass logging out. So, yeah, uh, while it was great to see migration, it still was a bit of a problem with automating because there were so many frivolous windows and, and extra things that made it difficult to use AppleScript to click through. Uh, so we found that if you use MB debug in conjunction with Resume Buddy yes, it has a very lean migration process uh, that we were able to pretty trivially uh, automate with AppleScript. And for people who don't know, AppleScript can um, click through various windows uh, as if a user's clicking it, kind of like AutoIt for, for Windows. Um, and we were able to use that to, to uh, automate going through the process without any user interaction. Okay, so we got around the uh, physical USB device by creating a small one gigabyte time machine backup uh, on the, like, a, like a partition on the hard drive. Um, you might be thinking one gigabyte doesn't sound small, but anyone who's done time machine can tell you one gigabyte is really small for time machine. Uh, and from there, it's the same steps we talked about where we're uh, poisoning the environment variables, setting the payload, and we just run AppleScript. And AppleScript will then run uh, Setup Assistant with the appropriate parameters. All right, so this is the, a demo we want to show you guys. So this is all real time. Um, I just showed like the first five lines of the Apple Kex exclude file, and we're going to run it. And then at the end, you'll see that the Apple Kex exclude plist file, which is SIP protected, uh, will be overwritten with the word migraine. All right, so I'm just showing this is restricted, which means it's SIP protected. And we're calling OSA script, which is Apple script. And from here, it's calling setup assistant. Uh, this is the time machine backup we talked about, the one gigabyte time machine backup. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's going to uh, find the right window and click through everything automatically. Uh, kind of hard to tell, but it, it basically deselected everything except for the dummy user I created. And from here, my exploit's gonna run it, and then we kill the, the migration daemon before it can reboot. And as you can see, uh, migraine is now overwritten, the Apple Kex exclude, and it is SIP protected. <laughs> All right, so you might be asking, well, who cares? Uh, well, SIP is, uh, like most security mitigations, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. And it's really great for protecting users from themselves and, and deleting files they shouldn't delete to cause unrecoverable uh, system states. Uh, it's also great for preventing um, uh, kernel access or rootkits. Uh, but the problem is once an attacker gets past that layer, they can do things that are extremely difficult to handle if you're like a, an AV product or an endpoint product. Uh, some of these examples would be like you can create undeletable malware in folders that even if you have every entitlement that you need uh, as a third party vendor, you, you can't delete it. Uh, obviously, you can also get a uh, kernel extension execution, like I talked about, which, which is essentially is going to be a rootkit in this scenario. Uh, and it can even bypass other security layers uh, in Mac OS, an example being uh, like TCC. So that means uh, an attacker could listen on your microphone or watch your camera, and you aren't notified, and you have no idea. All right, so I'm going to hand this back over to JBO to talk about their uh, fix and our attempts to thwart it. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so 
we disclosed uh, that bug to Apple back in May 2023. And, uh, you know, there was a bit of like back and forth because it's not a very trivial uh, exploit. But eventually they, they kind of were able to reproduce it and they, they fixed it in their beta and we were asked to assess their fix in their beta version. So we were like, okay, let's like run the beta version and see what's up. And the first thing that we noticed was something that I'd like to call a brutal fix, which I think that no other company in the world can do really, which is basically saying something like, oh, no, one, no more global event variables. And that's pretty amazing because they kill an entire like, bug class just by doing that. Um, and as you can see here, I basically try to uh, uh, use launchctl set env, uh, which is the proper way of setting an environment variable in launchd. Um, and basically telling me like we couldn't set the environment variable. Yeah, because, uh, uh, and, and it's not permitted because of SIP. So now, you know, with all the things that SIP uh, enforces, it also now enforces the fact that we can't really uh, touch uh, environment variables, which kind of like sucks and rocks at the same time. Uh, note that uh, this kind of enforcement happens at LaunchD. It doesn't happen at, at, uh, at LaunchCTL for obvious reasons. Otherwise, anyone would be able to bypass it. Uh, so that's fix number one. And then we were like, okay, we don't really need to affect all of the environment variables in the system. We just need to affect uh, uh, system migration D, which is like one process in the in the system. Yes, it is a daemon, so it's a it's a child process of uh, launch D. That's why setting the environment variables to launch D uh, works to begin with. But then, can we do something else? And launch daemons in macOS are described as you could see earlier by a plist file. Th that's the thing that Mike showed with all the different Mac uh, uh, Mac services, um, and. Those plist files kind of like have a way to uh, to define environment variables as well. Now the uh, plist file for system migration D sits in a directory that is also C protected, so you see how that won't work. But we were like, okay, let's define a new launch daemon, um, and you know we don't have to put it in a, the plist file in a C protected uh, directory, and basically run the thing, and it supports environment variables, so that's good, and. I don't want to talk too much about it, but basically there is a technology called launch constraints, which makes sure that things run, uh, things that are supposed to run by Apple are only ran by Apple. In this case, what it enforces is that the Mac services that you guys saw, uh, those six Mac services are actually owned by, um, um, by a file that was uh, launched from the SIP bypass, uh, the SIP uh, protected directory. So launch constraints make sure that we can't hijack any system launch daemons uh, definitions ever, which is another cool thing and pretty pretty new in macOS, uh, that technology. Uh, in here you can see our attempts. Basically that's the plist file that we created. This is a copy paste uh, from the uh, system, the original system migration D. The only difference is that um, I had to name it a bit different. So now it's named uh, com.jbo.apple and doesn't really shouldn't really affect anything. And the other part is, is this part where I basically uh, try to set the environment variables, uh, specifically Perl 5 opt. Now, again, this works, but, but doesn't work really because the really, the system migration D basically gets killed by, by the OS because of that thing. So uh, no, no dice. And then uh, the third fix, which, uh, or the third attempt that we had really, is that uh, we were like, okay, can we do something that doesn't have environment variables? Because we noticed, again, those are Perl scripts, and Perl scripts uh, sometimes have dependencies. Can we find a strong dependency in the Perl scripts? And as you can see in the right part, whoops, as you can see in the right part, you have use strict and then use file, uh, file base name. Those are basically imports, just like imports in, in uh, I don't know, in Python or whatever. And um, the file base name file is a, really translated to a directory in the file system, and base name is going to be looked, uh, looked after, base name.pm specifically, which is the Perl module. And Perl has dependencies and the lookup order. And the lookup order, you can print it with uh, the um, at inc uh, uh, Perl variable, as you can see here. And these are, this is the search order. The interesting part is that the, uh, the legitimate uh, uh, base file, um, uh, file base name, sorry, 
uh, lives under system library Perl 5.30, which is which is C protected. It's under slash system. But then the first two directories at least are not C protected. So we were like, okay, let's create slash library Perl 5.30 file base name.pm with arbitrary contents and you know trigger Perl without poisoning any environment variables and have it uh, basically run our arbitrary commands, which works and doesn't work. It works, uh, but uh, we were able to infect Perl, but not for C bypassing purposes. The reason for that is because Apple also had a tactical fix. If you remember that drop SIP uh, binary that we started the talk with, well, what Apple is now doing is basically dropping C bypassing capabilities before launching those scripts, which is kind of like a tactical fix, but it works because you can't do anything, even if you affect uh, Perl, it doesn't have the C bypassing capabilities anymore, so you can't use that for bypassing SIP. It's a cool way to persist in a Perl in uh, intensive environment, but not good for this exploit at least. Um, so that's that's the end really. Um, the vulnerabilities was assigned with CV 2023-32369. Apple has really made an amazing impression on us. Uh, those are solid fixes and you know, besides the tactical fix, which is good, like the other two fixes, the launch constraints and the fact that there are no more environment variables is really interesting because these are, are solid fixes in terms that they kill entire bug classes. They don't just kill our exploit, they kill future exploit. And as, as I hope you were able to see, uh, there are tons of exploits that rely on environment variable poisoning and stuff like that. Um, Besides that, Apple has granted a, a, a really nice uh, bounty money, which we donated to charity. Um, if, if you don't know that, by the way, and you get bounty from one of these big companies, you can ask them to donate to charity, and they will usually double that amount. So uh, donate to charity if you, I mean, if you're into that. And we wish to thank Apple for for everything here. Um, and it is our point of view that with Apple moving everything uh, to user land and creating separate security layers, as you could have seen with all the entitlements and stuff like that, uh, and they're basically killing uh, uh, kernel extensions and whatnot. So, you know, there are like the peasants and, and Apple and uh, in, in the OS at least. Um, and because they have the keys to the kingdom, we believe that similar bypasses will basically shake the Mac OS ecosystem because again, in this case, we were lucky that we are the ones who found it, but if you know there is some malware author that finds something like that, they can create undeletable malware and stuff like that, and no one will be able to do anything besides Apple, which might be too late. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks,